after studying this module, you shall be able to know about the importance of facial superimposition and learn about the various techniques of facial superimposition. In some forensic investigations, the usual methods utilized for human identification can be unsuccessful and the police may have few clues as to the identity of an individual. The majority of identification techniques require a known individual with whom to compare the data such as DNA, fingerprints or the dental records and where there are no suspects for identification, it is practically impossible to compare the data with records from an entire population. In these circumstances, the police may employ less definitive methods in an attempt to focus on a population from which the individual may be identified or can be identified easily. Facial reconstruction is one of the methods that are frequently employed in such investigations of identification technique. Facial reconstruction, otherwise also known as facial approximation, is the process that is utilized to reproduce the facial appearance or the facial characteristics of an individual and also include a number of different procedures. Traditionally, facial reconstruction has involved the analysis of skeletal detail to determine the facial morphology. However, the facial soft tissues may be present as partially decomposed, damaged, distorted or preserved remains. In these cases, it may not be appropriate to present the images of the remains to the public and facial reconstruction is utilized to visualize the facial appearance. In these circumstances, the practitioner will analyze the soft tissues of the face or the facial muscles rather than the skeletal detail. Although it may be possible to analyze both the soft and the hard tissues where clinical imaging or dissection are employed. Different approaches in this field of facial reconstruction or the facial superimposition have created some confusion with regard to the reliability and presentation of a facial reconstruction within a forensic scenario. Some practitioners attempt to reproduce the facial type and an approximation of the facial proportions and morphology that relies on sets of average tissue data and the facial templates relating to the sex, age and ethnic group of the individual and this has been stated in the studies of Everson etc. all in the year 1999, Vanazis etc. all in the year 2000 and by Stephen in the year 2004. Facial superimposition is one of the techniques that come under forensic facial reconstruction. It is the technique by which a particular skull recovered can be matched with the photograph. It is very helpful for identification purposes. More recent photograph is better and even photograph of the lateral view can be used also. Two negatives are prepared that is one of the person and other of the skull. Appropriate magnification is done to achieve maximum alignment and where interpupillary distance of both exactly matches. It is a known fact that the interpupillary distance of a person never changes regardless of his age. The two negatives are then superimposed by keeping over each other and various points are to be compared. The canthus, the nasion, the nasal spine and the lower border of the nose and upper jaw and the supraorbital ridges, the angle of jaw and external auditory meatus and the teeth etc. are compared and a photograph is taken which is analyzed for similarities and dissimilarities 
to arrive at a specific conclusion whether it matches or not this test has more of negative value as it can definitely rule out a combination of a photo and a skull though only a possibility of a match can be established next we will start with the two dimensional images in certain circumstances photographs or x-rays of the skull may be the only available information and access to the original specimen may be restricted due to the legal matters in accessibility destruction or damage where images of the skull are considered adequate the two dimensional facial reconstruction can be performed ideally the skull should be in the frankfurt horizontal plane or the fh plane or better known as fhp and for 35 mm photography a lens with a focal length of 100 to 200 millimeters and a camera position of no less than 12 feet per 3 meters from the skull will avoid distortion when there is access to the original specimen the facial anthropologist should take the scaling measurements or include visual scale in the foreground of the images if possible tissue depth markers should be attached to the skull prior to the production of images so as to provide the maximum number of tissue indications and when this is not possible but a scale has been included some of the tissue depth markers can be indicated on the overlays superimposed onto the images of the skull next coming on to the three dimensional skull models from limited two dimensional data or the 2d data when access to the original specimen is not possible either directly or via three dimensional clinical imaging methods of the three dimensional model production from the 2d data such as radiographs photographs and craniometrics may be utilized for that purpose radiographs and photographs are used as templates and multiple views are aligned using the cranial points as registration marks computer modeling software is then employed to create a three dimensional model as stated by wilkinson in the year 2005 or distort a template mesh that has been carried out by the studies of Davi etc all in the year 2005 to reproduce the skull morphology extrapolation of the surface morphology between the views is inevitable and the more views are available the more accurate the resulting 3d model or the three-dimensional model of the skull will be as these methods include a certain degree of estimation and loss of detail on the surface of the bone, any resulting facial reconstruction or approximation would require photographic records of the skull and an appreciation of the decrease in accuracy of any resulting face. Care must be taken when establishing the anatomical landmarks. Next, we will be studying about the three-dimensional skull models from clinical imaging. Where soft tissues are present, access to the original specimen is restricted. Or the computer-based facial reconstruction or approximation is planned. Cross-sectional data created by the X-ray computed tomography or the CT or surface scans can be employed to produce a three-dimensional digital model of the skull as stated by Spoor etc all in the year 2000. Sometimes replica skulls may be produced from their digital data using the stereolithography as stated by Jalgrim in 1995 or another form of three-dimensional model manufacture that has been stated by seeds etc all in the year 2005 
where digital data from surface scans and city scans are employed, the limitation of the data must be taken into account. With the city data, the slice thickness, scale plane, spatial resolution, filters and angle of rotation will affect the resulting three-dimensional model. In addition, the dental filling and appliances will also cause artifacts and may require some manual intervention. A variety of software packages render the surface cross-sectional city data by extracting the selected tissues and visualizing the tissues as three-dimensional models for use in the computer-based facial reconstruction or approximation systems or for the production of a physical replica. Surface rendering involves segmentation or the isolation of the tissue by thresholding. Interpolation between the slices so as to create a smooth surface and illumination of the surface. Spoor and his colleagues in the year 2000 stated that however improved visual representation does not imply that the image is more accurate as well. The extent to which the reconstruction reflects reality primarily depends upon the limitations inherent to CT scanning or the MRI that is magnetic resonance imaging. With surface scan data morphology, the details may be lost due to discrepancies at the apertures fossae and holes where the scanning mechanism cannot visualize the surface. In addition, hair on the face and head may cause surface artifacts also. As surface scanners produce a series of profiles from a number of viewpoints which then require the computational reconstruction of the object and subsequent manual editing so as to ascertain a clean raw data set and there may be inconsistencies to the original specimen also. Where possible, attention should be given to the original specimen so that errors are not perpetuated to the facial reconstruction. There are many surface scanners currently available including the laser as stated by Kao etc. all in the year 2005, by Moss etc. all in 1989, Bush and Anton Shin in 1996. The photographic projections by Yamada etc. all in the year 1999, Motoyoshi etc. all in the year 1992, Tickle Partsen in and the Karyoda in 1998, Curry etc. all in 2001, Siebert and Marshall in the year 2000 and the holographic techniques by Bongards etc. all in the year 2000 and by Giel etc. all in the year 2004 and the three dimensional models will be created that can be imported into the computer based facial reconstruction or approximation systems or employed to produce a three-dimensional replica. Where the skull is fragmented and each piece has been scanned, reassembly can take place using some computer-based systems also. These uh, computer-based systems, as stated by Wilkinson in the year 2003, Sanghara etc. all in the year 2002, Bib etc. all in the year 2000 will allow manually reassembly of the computer in three dimension or 3D. Computerized skull reassembly is much more efficient and rapid as no support mechanism is necessary. Computerized remodeling of the missing fragments is also easier and less time consuming with the computer based systems and perhaps involve a few hours of work rather than days or weeks. Some fragment edge details may also be lost on the digital models, but access to the original specimen will avoid any resolution problem. When replica skulls are produced from the digital models using stereolithography, as stated by Jalgrim in the year 
1995 or the three dimensional printing by seeds etc all in the year 2005 the models will suffer from the same limitations as that of the original digital data in addition the problems relating to the replication procedure may also occur such as material fragility that is susceptibility to water damage or crumbling material resistance that is difficulties with drilling or inability to bond with the glues or a smoothing of some of the details to the smaller bones next we will study about the craniofacial superimposition the photographic superimpositions in its simplest form includes creating a photographic image of the skull that can be superimposed on an anti-mortem photo of that individual or the person superimposition assumes that photographs accurately reflect the details of the face of the individual although using a camera solves some of the problems of direct cranial reconstruction such as tissue thickness or the ability of the artist the new problems are created one of the most critical is how to photograph the skull in the exact position and at the same distance as that of the anti-mortem photo within the craniofacial superimposition a number of different techniques have been proposed by investigators not only in the united states and canada but also in europe china and australia one of the famous examples of early attempts at craniofacial superimposition was the buck ruxton case in scotland in the year 1935. dr ruxton had done away with both his wife and female housekeeper because of his medical background he knew that various parts of the body such as fingerprints and ears could be used to identify the body and thereby lead to the killer therefore what he did was the dismemberment of both the victims and further dissected the soft tissues from the bone he then packaged the remains and deposited them in parcels across the landscape. As the investigations began and as more bundles were recovered or found, it was very difficult for identification as it superseded the shock over this grisly case. It became clear that two women had been the victims and that they were roughly of the same age. Eventually, suspicion focused on Dr. Ruxton, whose wife and housekeeper were mysteriously missing. Yet, there was no way to identify the dismembered as these two women were. With good anti-mortem photos of each victim available, John Gleister, was professor of forensic medicine at the University of Glasgow decided to try to identify both women through photo superimposition. One of the principal difficulties in this technique is placing the skull at the same distance and position as that of the head in the picture. Fortunately, in the case of Ruxton, Mrs. Ruxton had been photographed shortly before her death. The local town photographer was able to reconstruct the distances and the angles in the anti-mortem photo by using the same gown and tiara in the post-mortem photo. The match between anti-mortem and post-mortem photos along with other evidence was good enough to identify Mrs. Ruxton and to convict Dr. Ruxton. In more recent times, others have experimented with this technique and one of the most notable techniques was developed by Tidao Furier, forensic anthropologist in the US Army Central Identification Laboratory or CIL, first in Japan and then in Hawaii. Furier used a system that included a large format camera front surface mirror and a beam splitter or the partial mirror to create his superimpositions. This technique allowed him to use an original life 
photo to position the skull correctly. In this way, a transparency photo of the skull could be laid over the live photo to see if they matched. NS Clonaris and Furio used a variation of this technique to match a fragment of maxilla without teeth with an anti-mortem dental x-ray. In fact, the forensic odontologist probably used this technique more than other specialists because the structure and position of teeth, the surrounding bone of the jaws and the odontological repairs provide a great variety of structure that can be compared between anti and the post-mortem images. Next, we will study about the video superimposition technique and how this is useful in facial superimposition. The introduction of video cameras and computers has taken photo superimposition a step further. Instead of using mirrors and still cameras, two video cameras are used. One focuses on the skull and the other image is centered on the anti-mortem photo. As with still photos, the anti-mortem image is used to orient the skull. The difference is that a video mixer is used to superimpose the two images through the cameras. Regardless of the specific techniques of facial reconstruction or the craniofacial superimposition, the question remains how similar do the skull and photo have to be in order to be a match? Most researchers agree that craniofacial superimposition is a good technique for excluding the potential matches. If the antimortem and the postmortem images do not fit, they probably represent two different people. However, it is a technique so accurate that if two images match, they will represent one and only one person. Unfortunately, a detailed evaluation and test of the various techniques has not been done systematically, so this question remains unanswered. There are cases in which each of these techniques has been used successfully, yet both can be misleading. Virtually all the investigators who have proposed one of these techniques say that it should never be used by itself to establish the identity of an individual and other evidences is always required. Facial reconstruction or the craniofacial superimposition may prove to be useful but it should not be relied upon by to determine the identity of an individual. Let us summarize this module. Starting with the first, facial reconstruction, also known as facial approximation, is the process utilized to reproduce the facial appearance of an individual and includes a number of different procedures. Different approaches in this field have created some confusion with regard to the reliability and presentation of a facial reconstruction within the forensic scenario. Facial superimposition is one of the techniques that come under forensic facial reconstruction. The canthus, the nasion, the nasal spine and the lower border of the nose and upper jaw, the supraorbital ridges, angle of jaw, external auditory meatus and the teeth etc. are compared and a photograph is taken which is analyzed for similarities and dissimilarities so as to arrive at a specific conclusion. When access to the original specimen is not possible, either directly or via the three-dimensional clinical imaging, methods of three-dimensional model production from two-dimensional data such as the radiographs, photographs or craniometrics may be utilized. With the city data or the computed tomography, the slice thickness, scale plane, spatial resolution, filters and the angle of rotation will affect the resulting three-dimensional model. Photographic superimposition in its simplest form includes creating a photographic image of the skull that can be superimposed on an anti-mortem photo of the person. One of the most 
Famous examples of early attempts at the craniofacial superimposition was the Buck Ruxton case in Scotland in the year 1935. Facial Reconstruction or craniofacial superimposition may prove to be useful, but it should not be relied upon by itself so as to determine the individuality or the identity of an individual.